So, uh, our first speaker to kick off this fantastic bunch of speakers is, of course, Michael Shermer. Um, one of my personal heroes, the reason I call myself a uh, skeptic, he, of course, is the publisher of Skeptic Mag. His talk is called The Science and Morality. Uh, science and Morality, How Science Can Determine Right and Wrong. And this year, we're not doing songs for each speaker, we're doing haikus. So Michael's haiku is, Oh, Michael Shermer, on your bike you once met God. Or was it E.T.? Please welcome Michael Shermer. <laughs> right. <laughs> good morning, how we doing? Nice to see you all. Very good. Would you do me a favor at some time this weekend if you'd stop by the booth and say hi to Pat Lindsay and, and Daniel Loxton and all the crew that uh, handles our uh, Skeptic Magazine. If you could put the first slide up there, I'll just show you just some of our more recent covers of both uh, Skeptic and Junior Skeptic Magazine. Uh, we get that uh, slideshow working there. Uh, so uh, Daniel runs, uh, he does illustrates and, and writes uh, Junior Skeptic Magazine. And, uh, and then Pat Lindsay, are those up there? Can you see it? Nope. All right, we could go ahead and turn the slides on anytime you're ready. Yay, there we go. I guess I can't see him here. That's all right. So uh, anyway, so uh, all this happens does not happen in a vacuum. Um, there's a whole staff of people that make Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine run, and it's always nice when they get a little appreciation there. Um, so the talk I, I'm giving this morning is sort of the second half of what I did for you uh, last year on the, um, the subject of my next book, the, entitled The Moral Arc of Science, How Science Has Bent the Arc of the Moral Universe which of course comes from Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous uh, quip about that. And I showed you a slide last year about how uh, we can actually measure moral progress. For example, here are the number of states, both worldwide and within the United States, uh, that have decriminalized homosexuality from the 18th century to 2009. So this is a chart graphing the moral progress there, or anti-gay attitudes in the United States from 1973 to 2010. The downward sloping trend is the percentage of respondents giving less tolerant responses to questions like, is homosexuality wrong, uh, morally wrong, is it legal, should it be legal, equal opportunity, and so on. And as you've seen in the news recently, of course, we're making progress in gay marriage uh, with the uh, nuns leading the charge. <laughs> that is, the religiously unaffiliated, as you know, is the fastest gr growing religious group in America. It's, it's one out of five. It's 20 percent. Uh, that's 48 million voting adults. We are a powerful voting block. And, uh, and so, as I'll show in my book in, in more detail, uh, it's not religion leading uh, the moral progress charge. They're always about 50 years behind. So as I like to say in the case of gay marriage, in a few decades from now, we'll be looking back on this like we now look back on black and white drinking fountains. Uh, but, but, the, but the other thing is, is that the Christians will take credit for the gay marriage revolution. <laughs> you know that Episcopalian minister? That was our guy. <laughs> uh, and in fact, as you can see now, there's 12 states uh, that have passed gay marriage laws and, and one more, Washington, D.C., uh, in which there was a recent marriage. <laughs> which you'll be hearing more about at lunch today in the conversation with the amazing one. Still, there's a lot of people that believe that uh, gay marriage is immoral. Can we say that they are wrong? Yeah, but I mean really wrong, not just I think you're wrong or in Western culture you're wrong, but really wrong, objectively wrong, absolutely morally wrong to believe that gay marriage is, is immoral. The problem is, is that there's a lot of philosophers that technically speaking think that, well, nothing is written in stone. Uh, and that although they may support gay marriage or say, yes, in, in the United States, I think it should be legal, or in, within Western culture, I think it's morally acceptable, but of course, there's no outside source. There's no Archimedean point outside of the, of the earth that says that's a true moral value or that's a, a, a true immoral value, something like that. So what I want to 
talk about today is what makes something right or wrong. <clears throat> now, most of us, of course, reject the uh, what's called divine command theory or what might be called the ask God principle because the problem is if God does not decree something immoral, does that make it moral? If, if the seventh commandment was not in there, which a lot of congressmen wish it weren't, um, <laughs> <clears throat> thou shalt not commit adultery. If God had not included this, would that make adultery immoral or moral? Thou shalt not rape is not in the Bible. In fact, it's in many cases the opposite. You rape, pillage, and destroy, and, and it's a, one of the bennies of being a, a, a warlord. Uh, does that make it okay? Are we, in, in effect, how are we supposed to know God's moral commands? Do you read it in the Bible? Do you ask him? Do you pray? Do you just sit there and think and see what pops into your head? Uh, and if you read the Bible, of course, it doesn't give us much moral guidance. Now, the problem with absolute morality that, is that most of us reject it. Moral principles are not absolute where they apply to all people, in all cultures, in all circumstances, all of the time. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do have to take everything as black or white. <laughs> the problem with absolute morality is that, as that great moral philosopher Maxwell Smart said, don't be silly, 99. We have to shoot, kill, and destroy. We represent everything that's wholesome and good in the world. <clears throat> but yet, neither are mor uh, moral uh, principles relative, determined by only circumstance, culture, and history. I don't care what your lawyer said. They're not called the 10 recommendations. And of course, the problem with that is that then people think that anything goes. So often, I'm accused as an atheist of saying, well, so you think anything goes? You can do anything you want? You know, Hitler got away with it, and that's fine. No, no, I don't believe that. So what I'm trying to work on is a response to theists, essentially, in which I came up with what I call provisional morality. That is, moral principles are provisionally true. They apply to most people in most cultures, most circumstances, most of the time. I got this idea from one of my heroes and friends, Stephen Jay Gould, who defined a fact in science as something confirmed to such a degree that it would be perverse to withhold our provisional assent. Apples may start to rise tomorrow, but we don't really need to deal with that in public school classrooms because we know this as a fact. Fact, small f, true, truth with a small t. So in provisional morality, I'm thinking it, uh, along the lines of that things could be moral or immoral uh, in terms of whether to confirm to such an extent it would be reasonable to offer our provisional assent. For example, can we agree and answer the, about answering the question, is female genital mutilation wrong? Is this the best we can do? Yes, but only in Western cultures. We, we should respect other cultural traditions and not judge them. Can we offer our provisional assent that female genital, genital mutilation is morally wrong? Yes, we can. <clears throat> but why? What's the basis of it? How, do, how can you know that? Well. I say just ask the individual being mutilated and you'll get your answer. And if they can't speak words, their screams will give you their answer. Is it absolutely objectively wrong to deface a woman for any reason? Yeah, it is. But why? Just ask the individual being defaced and you'll get your answer. So instead of the ask God principle, I call this the ask first principle. If you want to find out whether an action is right or wrong, just ask first. Who do you ask? the individual moral agent upon, that's being acted upon. So like back to the adultery, question, the, the adultery question, if you're not sure if this is right or wrong, don't ask God, ask your intimate partner and they'll tell you. <laughs> or you don't really even need to ask, you already know, okay? So why the individual? What, why start there? Well, I claim that the individual is the primary moral agent because the individual organism is the principal target of natural selection and social evolution. This is not group selection, this is natural selection. Natural selection targeting the individual, and it still works. <laughs> Darwin Awards are being given out regularly still. Thus, the survival and flourishing of individuals is the basis for establishing values and morals, and so determining the conditions by which humans best flourish ought to be the goal of a science of morality. So we can say, that female genital mutilation is wrong because it permanently robs individuals of their evolved sexual nature that enables them to flourish. Just think of it this way. Ask yourself this. If female genital mutilation did not exist as a cultural practice and we caught a person inflicting it on a little girl, would we view it as a cultural practice to be tolerated? Hell no. 
This, so, <laughs> thank you. So you'll recognize this is the Izzat fallacy. I'm, com I'm committing the naturalism fallacy or the Izzat fallacy, which I think is itself a fallacy. The, the, the argument goes the way something is in nature, like predation or parasitism or slavery, is not the way it ought to be. Yes, sometimes that's true. But this does not mean that we should always negate the is for the ought. Since the individual is the primary moral agent, and since the survival and flourishing of individuals is the basis for establishing values and morals, determining the conditions by which humans best flourish ought to be the goal of our science of morality and the aim of a civil society. Let's go back to where we started. If homosexuality is natural, which it is, then gay rights ought to be supported. A couple of examples here, the rest of my talk will just be example after example of this. Just take the research from uh, Chris Bohm in his new book, Moral Origins, uh, in, which, uh, in which he makes an is ought argument. That, that, that is the way a thing is, uh, like bullying and free riding in hunter-gatherer communities, small groups, or any kind of society, destroys cooperation and altruism. That is, humans by nature have a propensity to be nice and cooperative and altruistic. Yet there are still, within all communities, there's a handful of psychopaths, bullies, free riders, nasties, meanies, and we have to deal with them, because if we don't, they're going to disrupt the group. So we ought to employ certain social technologies to deal with them, like social pressure, criticism, shaming, ostracism, ejecting them out of the group, or even, as Bohm shows, in many cases, capital punishment. Yeah, they just take these guys out for a hunt. Hey, let's go for a hunt, and then they come back without him. So in other words, we need a shadow of enforcement over us in many cases. <laughs> or take uh, Franz Duval's research in his latest book, The Bonobo and the Atheist. Quote, is and ought are like the yin and yang of morality. We have both, we need both, they're not the same. Yet they're also not totally separate. They complement each other. Values are embedded in the way we are. So, for example, to survive and flourish organisms, animals ought to feed themselves, escape predators, find mates, and so on, and social animals ought to get along. In other words, it's our nature to need to eat. It's our nature to need to get along. So that's the way things are, and therefore the way things ought to be is that we should structure things in such a way that we are better able to do that, survival, and survive and flourish. Or take uh, Pat Patricia Churchland's new book, Brain Trust. From a biological point of view, Basic emotions are Mother Nature's way of orienting us to do what we prudently ought to do. The social emotions are a way of getting us to do what we socially ought, and the reward punishment system is a way of learning to use past experiences to improve our performance in both domains. In other words, what's the, what's the reason we have emotions? I mean, they evolve for a reason. Emotions drive behavior. They cause us to act in a certain way to eat, to be hungry. So the, the, the motion of hunger pushes you to want to consume calories because you need to to survive. The emotion of arousal and sexual attraction leads you to reproduction, say. Or social emotions like guilt and shame. So I, I'm not interested in why this culture tells people to feel guilty about that or this other culture has different things you should be guilty about. What we want to know from an evolutionary perspective is why would people feel guilty about anything? And so, and the reason is, is because we ought to do certain things. And guilt is a way of getting us to sort of push along that direction. A nice research on this, lots of experiments, but <clears throat> this one by Farron Gachter, published in Nature. Uh, so this is a public goods game. So let's say there's four of you sitting around a table and I give uh, each of you 20 bucks. Each of you then in the first round has an opportunity to put some of your, your ones anywhere between one and 20 in, the, in an envelope anonymously and put it in the common pile. I'll take all the money that you donated and I'll double it and redistribute it equally among the four of you. So ideally, we should all put 20 bucks in because we all then have 100% return on our investment. But now maybe I'm thinking, well, hmm, it's anonymous. Maybe I'll put 19 in. Or maybe I'll put 15 in and hope the rest of you put 20 in. And you by the same calculus thinks, well, maybe I'll put 15 in. And maybe I'll put 10 in, and maybe I'll put 5 in, and pretty soon the whole thing collapses. So in the data chart there, you can see that without the opportunity for punishment, 
the uh, rates of cooperation go down. You can uh, put the slide back up there. And with the opportunity for punishment, that is, in the second round, you make it transparent. I know how much you put in, and you know how much I put in, and if you put in less and you try to free ride and cheat the system, we're going to punish you by taking away some of your money. All of a sudden, people become very nice and cooperative. So in other words, humans are by nature naughty and nice. <clears throat> so we need social technologies to deal with it. Okay, at this point you might be saying, but, but wait, I can think of exceptions where the individual is not as important as the group. Uh, say, you know, we, we, need, we need you to come in line to a certain way because the group is better, something like that. So I want to address the problem of what, what's called lifeboat ethics. That is, you've got a certain number of people in the lifeboat's about to sink, somebody has to go. Does your ethical system perfectly deal with lifeboat situations? And, and none of them do. So lifeboat ethics is really best for undergraduate philosophy courses to get students to think about all the different philosophical theories, but it doesn't do much beyond that because they all, they all have shortcomings. So for example, does the ask first principle apply to Hitler? Do we have to ask Hitler, is it okay if we kill you? <laughs> or in the case of Chris Baum's research, that you don't have to ask the bully if, we, if it's okay to off him. Do we have to ask Osama bin Laden if it's okay to kill him? No, the ask first principle applies to most people in most circumstances, most of the time, even if there are exceptions. So all moral systems have shortcomings. <laughs> so why not add one more arrow to the quiver of ethics by adding science? Without worrying about asking Hitler, can we say provisionally that burning this 20-year-old New Guinea woman alive on February 6th of this year for witchcraft was immoral? Yes, we can. Why is it wrong? Because it decreases the survival and flourishing of the woman tortured and torched. Or if the survival and flourishing of the individual is the basis for establishing values and morals, then this graph tracks moral progress. That is, the number of people living under $1.25 a day, adjusted for inflation, since 1990 has, has decreased by half. That's moral progress. How do you know it's moral progress? You just ask the people that are starving, would you rather have more than $1.25 a day or less than $1.25 a day? Or as Bill Gates shows, the number of cases of polio has decreased from 350,000 in 1988 to 222 in 2012. Is that a moral good? Well, just ask the 349,778 non-polio victims how they feel about that, and they will tell you. Or ask the, the 5.1 uh, million children under the age of five who didn't die in 2011, who in 1990 would have died, according to UNICEF and their data charts there. <clears throat> or just go to Africa, where much of this progress is being made, and the spread of democracy. So let's talk about political systems. Can we say that one political system is better than another political system? I think we can. The green, the green ones there are varying shades of democracy, and the others are coming along slowly. But democracy is spreading rapidly in Africa, and this is a good thing, because more democracy has led to better governance. Politicians who want to be reelected need to show results. Armies mostly stay in their barracks. Big man leaders are becoming rarer. Warlords like Joseph Kony stand out as an exception today in a downward trend in the decline of power. Africans, for example, no longer have to worry about these war criminals from the Liberian Civil War with their noms de guerre. General Rambo, General Jesus, General Murder, General Jungle King, Colonel Evil Killer, Colonel Action, Major Trouble, and my favorite, General Butt Naked. So the number of armed conflicts in Africa is down from about 30 a year in 1989 to little more than a dozen a year today. The number of successful coups has fell by two-thirds. Is this moral progress? Just ask this guy. So democracies are better for individuals than autocracies and theocracies and dictatorships and all the other forms. Uh, because it leads to more peace. It leads to the opportunity for people to survive and flourish at a better rate. Not that they're perfect, but uh, the two first thinkers that I came across to, to put this thesis forward is Kant in his book, Perpetual Peace, and then Rudy Rommel uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Democracy is a method of nonviolence, but they didn't quantify it. They didn't have data sets. 
So last year, for example, I showed you the data sets from Bruce Russett and John O'Neill to test the democratic piece there. You know, this is the one where Thomas Friedman says, no two countries with McDonald's ever go to war. And then, of course, everybody jumped on him and said, wait a minute, there was a McDonald's in this country and a McDonald's in this country, and they had a little skirmish. Okay, it's not perfect. <laughs> We're talking about statistical trends here. So what Russett and O'Neill did is they took the correlates of war project of tracking 2,300 militarized interstate disputes between 1816 and 2001, and then used the polity project that assigns each country a democracy score. Some countries are better at democracy than others. Some democracies are more or less transparent. Sometimes their leaders are chosen openly. Sometimes there's too, more bribery and so forth. And what they found was that when um, both countries are fully democratic, that is, they score high in the polity score of democracy, uh, disputes fell by 50%. And when the less democratic pair a uh, member of a pair leaned toward autocracy, it doubled the chance of a quarrel. So as democracy increases, violence decreases, and that's a moral good. And that's why we've seen moral progress in tracking the number of democracies that have grown since the 1980s, um, more than doubled, and the number of autocracies that have collapsed since the 1980s, uh, way, way down. Or just take, again, it's kind of the low-hanging fruit, but we have to start somewhere. <clears throat> the difference between North Korea and South Korea. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that is, we're just taking per capita GDP in North Korea versus South Korea. And North Korea, it's $1,122 a year. That's per capita GDP versus 19614 Which would you rather have? It's quite dramatic in satellite pictures between South Korea and North Korea. Or in the height of about five inches difference between North Koreans and South Koreans because of their crappy diets in North Korea. <clears throat> So democracies place more emphasis on individual rights and individual liberty than any other form of governance. And that's why I think it's moral progress, that we can actually say it's really, actually, really, absolutely better because, uh, they, but because they use the individual more than other forms of governance as the guide for what's the right thing to do. In a way, so I'm just going to try this out. I'm, just, I'm trying out different things, by the way. So if you want to stop by the booth this weekend and go, I didn't like that idea, or have you thought of trying it this way, or I disagree with that, or here's another example, or whatever. That's all going in the book, so <laughs> you're my database here. Uh, so I think, so here's an idea I'm trying. Isn't democracy kind of an ask first principle? That is, a, an election is, is a way of asking voters how you feel about an act of legislation or a representative, and, and they'll tell you at the voting booth. Now, of course, you might get outvoted. Well, okay, uh, that's just the way it goes, but you get another election. And you can throw the bums out and bring some new bums in. So in a way, I think democracy is a little bit like science. And this is the argument nicely made by Timothy Ferris. Yes, this is the same Timothy Ferris that writes all those wonderful books about astronomy and cosmology. Uh, his last book is on the science of liberty, democracy, reason, and the laws of nature. The new government, our, our government, like a scientific laboratory, was designed to accommodate an ongoing series of experiments extending indefinitely into the future. Nobody could anticipate what the results might be, so the government was structured not to guide society toward specified goal, but to sustain the experimental process itself. So in a way, like you have all 50 different states trying 50 different slight variations on, um, on election systems, on tax uh, rates, and, and so forth. There are little experiments you can run, and then other states can try to model after that state, and, and so forth. So it, 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 and the idea is that nobody knows how to run a country. So let's set it up like a scientific experiment. and We'll just run the experiment over and over and over and keep collecting more data and tweak it and refine it and so forth. In other words, the constitution of human societies ought to be built on the constitution of human nature. <clears throat> and science is the best tool we have for understanding the way our nature is. So even though a science-based moral system is not perfect, it complements philosophical moral systems and allows us to employ empiricism and reason to understanding the moral universe. So even though we can't do everything, we can do something to bend the arc of the moral universe toward truth, justice, freedom, and prosperity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll, I'll end this little essay on uh, where we began and the inspiration for my book with who I consider to be the greatest speech writer and deliverer of all time. In, in this, his second most famous speech, How Long, 
not long, where he used this phrase. Asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, yes, sir. however frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, sir. How long, yes, sir. not long, do yes, forever on the scaffold, wrong yes, forever on the throne. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Scaffold sways the future. Yes. Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, How long? Not, Not long. Not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, sir. He's trampling out the bidders oh, where the oh, grapes of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword, yes, his truth is marching on. Yes, he has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. Peace he is lifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Yes, oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Yes, Glory, hallelujah. Yes, Glory, hallelujah. Yes, You want to change the world, learn to speak like that. <laughs> well, obviously, Martin Luther King used a lot of literary and biblical and religious references in his time. That was fine. I think, as I'll show, and as we know, religion is always behind the moral progress and the social changes that happen, as in the gay marriage example. And in fact, it's secular values, the enlightenment that's really driving this. And the enlightenment is really what science is all about. I use the word science in a much broader sense. I mean, not just empiricism and data collection and statistical tests and experimentation, but reason and logic using the human mind uh, and not turning to supernatural forces to bring about these changes. We have to bring about these changes, and I claim it's us, the nuns, the enlightened ones, the secularists who are bringing these about. So it's our job to go out and make these changes happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Michael Shermer, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Shermer. Thank you so much.